morning, everyone. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. As is, as is the case with most Tuesdays, Governor Scott is currently on another call with fellow governors and White House officials. He'll be joining us shortly. Today, I'll start off with an update on our progress with the vaccination program, as well as announce new and convenient locations where you can walk in and get your shot this week. Um, we haven't given up yet. There's lots of opportunities to get a shot, and we hope you take advantage of those uh, for those that have not been vaccinated. And then I'll wrap up with an update of our efforts with the General Assistance Housing Program. As you probably know by now, on Sunday evening, we achieved our long-awaited goal. Eighty percent of eligible Vermonters have been vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. As of this morning, that number is 18.3 percent of eligible Vermonters 12 years old and above have received at least one dose of the vaccine. We are the first in the country to achieve this milestone. This is remarkable. But we are not stopping there. We will, we will uh, all benefit if more Vermonters are vaccinated against this terrible virus. We also anticipate that children age 5 to 11, a group of approximately 44,000, will become eligible to be vaccinated in the fall. And we've begun planning for that, as the governor had mentioned yesterday. In terms of our overall progress, here's the breakdown. As I mentioned, Vermonters 12 plus with at least one dose, 80.3% best in the nation. Vermonters 18 plus with at least one dose. This is the one that the White House uses, and they use a unreconciled number. Um, so I'll give you that number that they use directly from the CDC. It's 83.6%. And all Vermonters with at least one dose, uh, it's 71%, and that's a reconciled number that we, we reconcile with DFR. Let's move on and look at the many convenient opportunities available to get vaccinated. There are 59 clinics planned this week, and I urge all Vermonters to take advantage of them and protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community. You can visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine for more information. Most pharmacies, and you can start seeing them here, most pharmacies around Vermont are also offering walk-in vaccinations. Ask your local pharmacist or simply walk into CVS, Hannaford Food and Drug, Walmart, Walgreens, Price Shopper Market 32, Rite Aid, Shaw's Supermarket, or Costco. Now here's what to expect for pop-up clinics this week. Today, as you can see, there's quite a long list that we'll go through, but it's important because it shows that we are putting out the effort to make sure that every Vermonter that wants a vaccine gets a vaccine. We'll be at the Community Health Center of Burlington, there Hubbardton Forge uh, in Castleton, Northwest Medical Center Urgent Care in St. Albans, People's Health and Wellness in Barrie, Sheldon Food Shelf in Sheldon, Snyder's Home in Shelburne, uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, their Express Care, and the University of Vermont at several locations, which is at their main campus pharmacy, at their Fannie Fanny Allen campus pharmacy, and at their outpatient pharmacy on South Prospect Street in Burlington. Tomorrow, we'll be at Cabot Co-op in, uh, in Cabot, the Capital Candy Company in Barrie, again, the Community Health Center in Burlington, EMS Clinic at the State uh, Capitol in Montpelier, Mount Escutney Hospital in Windsor, North Avenue Co-op in Burlington, North Country Hospital in Newport, Northwestern Medical Center, Urgent Care in St. Albans, and S Southwestern Vermont Medical Care, Express Care, uh, Me Medical Center Express Care in Bennington, and again, you can see the, the various pharmacies at the UVM uh, Medical Center at the main campus, Fannie Allen, and on, Pros on Prospect Street. And then, of course, um, one more, uh, West Brattleboro Fire Station in Brattleboro. On Thursday, once more, Community Health Center in Burlington, Food City in St. Albans, Jay Peak Resort in Jay, Mountain Health Center in Bristol, uh, Northeastern Vermont Regional 
Hospital in St. Johnsbury, Northwest Urgent Care in St. Albans, Southwest uh, Express Care in Bennington, the St. Albans Bay Farmers Market, the St. Albans District Office, that's the, um, the district office, the state office building in St. Albans, uh, the St. Johnsbury uh, Probation and Parole Office, Sun Common in Waterbury, all the UVM uh, pharmacies uh, that I talked about previously. And on Friday, Cabot Creamery again, uh, again the Community Health Center in Burlington, Gifford Health Center in Randolph, Green Street School in Brattleboro, Mount Escutney again in Windsor, Northwestern, Southwestern Express Care or Urgent Care Centers, and all the UVM uh, pharmacy locations. On Saturday, the American Legion Post 10 in Barrie, the Johnson Transfer Station, the Montpelier Mountaineers, the Northwest Farmers Market in St. Albans, Northwestern Medical uh, Center Urgent Care, Outer Limits Health Club in Brattleboro, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center uh, Express Care, the Monkey House on behalf of downtown Winooski, and the UVM uh, Medical Center Main Campus Pharmacy in Burlington. And on Sunday, uh, Northwestern Medical Center Urgent Care, the Stowe Transfer Station, the University of Vermont uh, Medical Center Main Campus Pharmacy. So as you can see, there are a lot of opportunities. And I, as I said, over 50 um, coming up this week in order to get vaccinated. In, future, uh, in the future, we'll start planning to uh, combine both vaccination and testing capabilities as we move forward. We're in the planning stages, and as I mentioned, we're in the planning stages uh, for vaccination, perhaps in the fall, of those that are five to 11 years old as well. So let me turn to another subject. In terms of general assistance, in terms of the general assistance housing program, we are currently housing 2,295 people in 1,631 hotel and motel rooms across the state. And um, we are starting to lose capacity every day in the, in the hotel motels um, in terms of rooms as the state begins to reopen. This program had restrictive criteria for eligibility in place before the pandemic. We recognize the need to protect the most vulnerable and suspend, and we suspended all eligibility criteria during the pan pandemic. On June 1st, new eligibility criteria was implemented for new households seeking assistance. It is more expansive than the pre-pandemic uh, pre eligibility with regard to housing households with children, people with disabilities, and older Vermonters. And we are still serving households at risk of domestic violence or other life-threatening conditions households including a pregnant person and victims of national, natural disasters such as fire and flood. The utilization of the program has decreased significantly since the beginning of June. Households currently in motels will be screened using the new eligibility guidelines effective July 1. We project that approximately two thirds of households in motels will continue to be eligible for an additional 84 days at that point. This includes the most vulnerable populations I mentioned earlier. Households with children and people with disabilities may be able to have their emergency housing extended past 84 days, depending on their circumstances. We do not intend to delay implementing uh, the new eligibility cr criteria for the emergency housing plan we have worked collaboratively with several community partners, including Vermont Legal Aid, COTS, Vermont Community Action Partnership, Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, Chittenden Homeless Alliance, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, and Groundworks. And we have agreed upon an intentional phased transition. Our plan for transitioning away from the expanded motel voucher program has specific phases that we intend that were intended to avoid a, a cliff, um, and therefore we have phased in new eligibility 
for new households first and will subsequently apply those criteria to currently housed households beginning in July. This tiered approach also means that eligible households, particularly households with children, older Vermonters, and individuals with disabilities will continue to be housed for an additional three months, and in some cases, even longer. <clears throat> households who will be ineligible for continued housing as of July 1st may be eligible for essential payment of $2,500 to help with expenses. The intention is to provide a cash payment that can help those, uh, these households care for their own basic needs. In addition to the essential payments, the Department for Children and Families has other programs that can, that can help households who will still be housed in motels. Households may qualify for Vermont emergency rental assistance to help with security deposits, rents for up to 12 months, and utility bills. Financial assistance up to $8,000 for eligible costs such as security deposits, moving costs, transportation, program fees is also potentially available to help ho ho households in motels uh, transition into and keep stable housing. This flexibility money is the rapid resolution housing initiative that we have put in place. In terms of mass feeding program, the Department of Children and Families will also be able to continue offering the maximum emergency allotment of three squares Vermont benefits. These maximum emergency allotments our supplemental food benefits to help three square Vermont households during the pandemic. All elig eligible three squares Vermont households receive at least $95 a month in these extra food benefits, with many households receiving more, more up to the maximum allowed based upon the household size. We will also continue to work on connecting kids to summer meals through the Agency of Education, as well as connecting households in motels to Meals on Wheels as appropriate. The governor's new executive order will help sustain the housing and food programs as it allows for the continued drawdown of FEMA funding to support non-congregate housing and the Department of Children and Families will be able to continue to offer the maximum emergency allotment of three square Vermont, three squares Vermont benefits. We are doing everything possible to assist Vermonters and allow a smooth transition into more permanent housing and support services that will meet their long-term needs. As I mentioned in FY21, we'll, we'll spend substantial amounts of money, um, approximately $80 million uh, for this program and in FY22, we are still spending substantial amounts of money for this program in, in, in terms of uh, 38 million, approximately $38 million. That compares to what the program was originally spending pre-pandemic, which was five to $7 million. So you can see we're still continuing a substantial investment in this program to make sure there's a step down. In the future, the best solution to homelessness is permanent housing. And as the governor has mentioned, and as he has proposed, and as the legislature has put into the budget, we have substantial amounts for uh, building permanent housing for, these, for people that are homeless. So we will continue to do everything possible to make sure that transition to a permanent solution, permanent housing is, is available. I'll wrap it up by extending my deepest gratitude to all of our vaccination partners and community partners that we, that we, have, um, that we have collaborated with to have such success in the vaccination program. It is impossible for me to mention everyone involved, but I do know the dedication and sacrifice that has been taken place in the service of Vermonters over the past 15 months. Many people, 
many of the people that I've just described um, took time away from their families in order to serve Vermonters. And it was gratifying for me to see just how dedicated all these people were. I also want to acknowledge that Vermonters really stepped up to get their shot. Our state may be small, but we are mighty, and I thank you all. I'll turn it over now to Commissioner Pichek for our weekly modeling update. Well, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Smith, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, COVID-19 trends in Vermont uh, continued to see significant improvement this week, and our forecasts for the near future have never been better. Quite simply, Vermont remains the safest state in the country. We have the country's lowest case, hospitalization, and death rates, and we maintain the country's highest vaccination rates. This week, we are only reporting 48 new COVID-19 cases, the first time in nine months that Vermont has reported fewer than 50 cases in a week. Cases are now down 97% since our peak on April 1st, and our seven-day average continues to fall as well, down 41% this week. We are seeing cases fall consistently across all age groups, and only two cases in our most vulnerable age group, those over 65 years old. Further, the median age of cases now stands at 32 years old. We're also seeing cases fall consistently across Vermont, with every region of our state seeing cases trending down. And Grand Isle and Addison counties this week did not report a single case. Case trends are continuing to closely follow our forecasts, and over the next couple of weeks, we anticipate seeing cases falling into the low single digits and remaining there for some time. We also saw a significant drop in Vermont's hospitalization rate, declining 53% this last week and 74% over the last two weeks. And we continue to frequently see days where our ICUs are free of any individuals requ requiring critical care in Vermont. And we anticipate that these rates will continue to move even lower in the weeks ahead. Most importantly though, Vermont did not report a single COVID-19 death this week and was the only state in the country to be this fortunate. And generally our fatality rate has stayed extremely low with only one COVID-19 death reported in the last 29 days. We continue to forecast that Vermont will have five or fewer COVID-19 deaths in the month of June, a step down again from last month and a big step down from the months during the winter time period. We are seeing these continued improved trends because of our sustained vaccination progress. We see that for the second week in a row, Vermont remains at the top of all vaccination categories in the country, a very impressive accomplishment and certainly a testament to the character of our state. After crossing the 80% threshold, the CDC is now reporting an additional 983 Vermonters have started vaccination, moving our percent of eligible Vermonters who have started vaccination up to 80.3%. With COVID-19 uh, improving across the uh, state, the region, and the country, we did want to provide an update on the situation in Canada and Quebec. Similar to the United States, Canada experienced a surge of COVID-19 cases this winter, with case rates and death rates reaching their highest point before improving late in the winter and early in the spring. But unlike the US, Canada saw a significant surge again this past spring due to the spread of more transmissible variants of COVID-19 and a limited vaccine supply. However, over the last four weeks, the Canadian vaccination rates have increased dramatically, surpassing the United States, the United Kingdom, and even Israel in terms of the percentage of the Canadian population that has started vaccination. Now, with one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, its cases have also fallen significantly, down 79% over the past month. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that Canada would begin to reopen, including reopening its border, when the country hit 75% of its population who had received at least one dose, and 20% that was fully vaccinated. Canada currently stands at 64.7% having started, 
and 12.2% being fully vaccinated, meaning that they are likely a matter of weeks away from meeting these thresholds. Quebec has had a similar experience with its vaccination rates increasing dramatically over the past few weeks, now standing at 68.9% of its total population having started vaccination, and its cases have also dramatically decreased over the past few weeks. Looking more broadly at our region, things continue to look good in the Northeast with cases falling for the 10th straight week. Cases this week were under 6,300 for the region. This is the first time cases have ever been this low since last March. Additionally, New England continues to lead the country in vaccinations with the six New England states also being the six leading states in terms of the percentage of their residents who are fully vaccinated. We've also continued to closely watch the reopenings across the region, and at this point, all New England states have fully reopened, uh, for some for as long as five weeks, and in each case, they have continued to see their cases, hospitalizations, and deaths trend down. All of these point to a continued expectation of an enjoyable and very safe summer here in Vermont and in the region. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Well, it's been quite a while since we've had back-to-back -back COVID press briefings, and those usually weren't for good reasons. Um, but I'm really glad this week it's because of the great news that the governor first announced yesterday. One of the tricky things about the field of public health is that we almost never get to a point where a disease is completely gone. Even when we hit a significant milestone as we did yesterday, the effort continues. So long as COVID-19 is still present, even at the low levels we currently have in Vermont, it's my job and that of everyone connected to your health to make sure that you and all of us continue to do everything we can to ensure that we don't lose ground. So let's get to it. Meeting our goal of getting vaccine into the arms of 80% of everyone age 12 and over is deeply meaningful. As I said 24 hours ago, this achievement means fewer chances for COVID to spread, fewer people hospitalized, and as we all hope, as little additional loss of life as possible. But low incidence rates aren't the same as zero. This remains an active and innovative virus and we all must take the actions needed to stop it in its tracks. I'm very encouraged by how well Vermont has responded to our call to get vaccinated and for understanding the reasons for those appeals. That being said, nearly one in five people eligible to be vaccinated have yet to take that step. If you still have questions, visit our website or talk to a friend, a loved one, or your doctor and find your reason. Let me give you an update on one such important reason, the Delta variant. This is the variant that's now spreading widely in many countries, and at this point accounts for about 10% of cases in the United States. And in the United Kingdom, it accounts for more than 90% of new cases. This variant, formerly called B16172, and first identified in India, is showing traits of being far more contagious and potentially more dangerous than the strains we've been seeing, though the science is not yet clear on the latter. Even here in Vermont, we've identified three cases through our genomic sequencing of positive cases. Our lab is now fully capable of doing whole genome sequencing, and as we have less cases reported on a daily basis, we are able to do whole genome sequencing on a higher percentage of our cases. We had formerly one case in an international traveler. For the latest two that have just been reported out today, one was in a domestic traveler returning to Vermont, and the other we do not have exposure information on. Now, I'm hopeful we don't see more of this virus, but we have seen this show before. Variants that start slow, then spread and finally become the predominant strain in the country. How do we stop it? We all know the answer, 
vaccination, with a hefty side of continued prevention measures like hand washing and staying home if you're sick. Because then, the virus quickly reaches a dead end in Vermont, and it can't be transmitted from person to person, and can't mutate and lead to more virulent strains. It's also okay to keep going with some of the prevention steps we adopted for the past year and a half. We're no longer required to wear a mask, and I've already seen more smiles in the last day than I have for months. One side effect of less mask use is that you should be prepared for a slight surge in the numbers of other respiratory virus illnesses being seen, such as the common cold. It turns out that masking was actually effective in preventing a lot more than just COVID. Now, this is a transitional period for many of us. You may personally still be more comfortable wearing your mask. If that's true, go ahead. In fact, I've seen many people in places like airports who have done so for years. We've learned a great deal about how masks can protect you and others. And I remind all of us, whether we choose to wear a mask or not, please don't judge. As in so many aspects of life as human beings, none of us can know anyone else's physical or emotional situation. Kids in particular are in a bit of a gray area. Currently, we continue to recommend mask use by children under age 12 when indoors because they are not yet able to be vaccinated. However, as we have every step of the way, we are closely following the science and our own data, including case levels and virus transmission. We may get to a point, perhaps fairly soon, where case numbers are so consistently low in Vermont that we may conclude the risk of transmission and illness are low enough to warrant a change in that recommendation. Parents and caregivers should rest assured that the health and well being of our children will drive our decisions, and you will have all the information and guidance you need to protect and promote the health of your children. Thank you again for your trust and confidence. These past months have shown that even the often hidden dynamics of a virus new to the human race cannot stand up to the determination of Vermonters. And it looks like the governor has returned from his phone call. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Good morning, everyone. Just got off the phone with fellow governors and White House officials. Dr. Walensky said nationwide trends continue to move in the right direction, and 64.5% of those over the age of 18 have received at least one dose. She also talked about the Delta variant, which uh, Dr. Levine just spoke about. Uh, importantly, she noted that the science shows vaccines are effective against this variant as well, saying vaccines are the best um, defense against it. So again, if you hadn't, haven't gotten your shot yet, there's still many easy opportunities to do so, and you can help make sure we keep these variants at bay. It's also important uh, to get your second dose of uh, Pfizer or Moderna when you're due for that. And has been, as has been the case for the last several weeks, our allocation of Pfizer and Moderna doses remain the same. Uh, no new allocations for J&J, &J, although they did say the FDA extended the shelf life of J&J &J by six weeks, so that's good news. So that was about it on the White House call. So as you know, we reached our 80% threshold, and as a result, I issued a directive to lift all remaining restrictions. I want to once again thank all of Vermonters for their hard work and commitment. We lead the nation because of you. As we've said, and as you saw from Secretary Smith, we're not letting up. Uh, because the people we vaccinate tomorrow are just as important as those we vaccinated yesterday. Although our strategy will evolve as we enter this new phase, phase uh, meeting people where they are and making Shaw successful is our goal. And we're still committed to doing the work that needs to be done. Next, tonight at midnight, the state of emergency, which has been in place since March 13, 2020, will expire. 
Unlike uh, every other month since today, it will not be extended. When a governor declares a state of emergency, they are granted a significant amount of authority to act quickly for the public's health and safety. They're often used for natural disasters like after Tropical Storm Irene or blizzards or major flooding. This state of emergency has been unique, both in its length and nature, because the challenges we faced with, um, with COVID isn't something we've ever seen in our lifetimes. However, in our system of government, extending a state of emergency longer than it's needed isn't appropriate. And authority must be restored to the normal process with checks and balances. So as a result of Vermonters stepping up to be vaccinated at such a high rate, restrictions are no longer needed. And the state of emergency is no longer needed either. Now, as I said weeks ago, uh, we want uh, to make sure that when lifting this order, people who've relied on some of the programs and services aren't left behind. I asked my general counsel, Jay Johnson, to work with agencies and departments to identify programs that will still be needed. As a result, today I will sign a separate executive order under my general powers, not my emergency powers, to do the following. First, it maintains the National Guard's active state service status. This will allow the Guard to continue assisting with our response as needed, including with vaccination clinics. The order also extends Vermont's access to federal funding for expanded emergency housing and feeding programs, which Secretary Smith discussed earlier. We know many Vermonters relied on these services throughout the pandemic, and Vermont has been seen as a model for our efforts to safely house those experiencing homelessness. We believe this has had a significant impact, and our goal is to help make sure there's a smooth transition back to pre-pandemic services. Uh, another uh, provision relates to H313, which I signed into law last week, among other things. This keeps a portion of my executive order in place, allowing restaurants and bars to continue serving drinks to go. This has been an important revenue stream for both employers and employees in an industry that has been hit especially hard. Uh, the law, H313, goes into effect July 1, so the order will serve as a bridge until we get there. Even as this emergency comes to an end, we know there are still Vermonters struggling because of it. Protecting the most vulnerable has been one of the top priorities of my administration over the last four years. As we enter the recovery phase, that remains true. My team and I will focus on building a stronger, more prosperous Vermont, learn the lessons of the pandemic, and continue to do whatever we can to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable. With that, we'll go back to questions, or we'll go to questions, I guess. Yeah, good timing today. Yeah. We'll start with Calvin Cutler, Calvary. Um, thanks, Governor. I think this might be a question for Secretary Smith. So regarding the $2,500 stipend giving to people transitioning out of the hotel voucher. What sort of checks will there be to make sure that this money is, is going where it needs to go and that will be appropriately spent? Okay. We actually have uh, Commissioner Brown, Sean Brown, on the line. He might be more appropriate to answer that question. Sean, did you hear the question? Uh, hello? Try once again. Sean? Hello, Governor. This is Commissioner Brown. Um, could you have the reporter re repeat the question? I had trouble hearing it. Uh, Calvin, could you do that once more? Sure. So regarding the, the $2,500 transitional stipend giving to people to um, transition out of the hotel voucher program, what sort of checks will there be to make sure that, that the money is being spent uh, where it needs to be spent on housing? Um, the, the payment is not intended specifically to, to cover the cost of housing. Um, it's being referred to as an essential payment so that um, individuals have flexibility to meet whatever needs that they have as they transition out of the program. 
Um, so it can meet a variety of needs. And so we're working with our community partners across the state um, to make sure that all of the households that are eligible uh, receive the payment. Um, we'll also be offering to those households that are interested some financial literacy training um, and then making sure they have the ability to access those funds and cash the check and access them. But they really have flexibility to meet whatever needs they're experiencing um, as they transition out of the program. Um, Governor, in 30 days now, the uh, eviction moratorium expires. Um, I guess what's, what's the plan from the statewide perspective after that, that is triggered? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the legislature put the 30 days in place after the emergency order expires. Uh, they felt comfortable in giving that amount of time uh, for people to get uh, their uh, acts in order, uh, so to speak. And, uh, and I think it's at that point up to the judiciary uh, to take over. Um, so there are continue to be protections in place. Uh, they will take each case and make sure it's viable and, uh, and appropriate. So we have to have faith in the uh, third branch of government. And I guess the last follow-up to that is, you know, there, there have been federal programs uh, designed to give direct aid to renters um, to prevent evictions. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're hearing anecdotally that this money has been, you know, in other states, but also here in Vermont, it's been slow to get out the door. So I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if, if you're concerned about, you know, money not getting out the door in time or if there's any sort of concern. Yeah, I think there has been a little bit of a, a, a delay, I'd say, uh, with the Treasury. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, we're getting up to speed in that respect. So I think by the, by the time uh, the 30 days uh, eclipses that we'll be... We'll be in good shape. Thanks. Julie Sherman, Local 22, Local 44. Hi, Governor. Um, I wanted to know, um, have you been or plan to be in contact with other governors or administrations um, to share your vaccination strategies? Well, I mean, we, I do uh, confer with fellow governors on a, on, in, you know, ongoing basis. Uh, um, we get together every couple of weeks and just exchange ideas. I've been exchanging our ideas along the way. Uh, everyone has uh, different approaches uh, to their to their states. Uh, they know their states better than we do. Uh, I will admit that uh, what we do in Vermont might not work in Texas and vice versa. And uh, so you have to kind of um, cater to to your state and figure out what works for you. But we certainly have uh, offered uh, our perspective, uh, and uh, I know we're a small state, but uh, it still, you know, comes down to math. And uh, and from a percentage state standpoint, uh, we've done a lot of things right. But it it has a lot to do with the attitude uh, of, uh, of Vermonters, I believe. And uh, we've been we've been blessed with the right attitude here. And I just want to ask. Um, I want to confirm. Um, lifting all remaining restrictions means no masks, um, no capacity limits uh, when it comes to gatherings. Um, what else uh, might we notice? Yeah, just think back pre-pandemic, the way it was when there was no restrictions whatsoever, and that's what we're going back to. Uh, the only difference might be if there's uh, any federal restrictions, like with with uh, transportation. For instance, public transportation, they still have guidelines in place for that. And I think, I believe, uh, long-term care facilities as well. But other than that, uh, just, just go back to where we were uh, probably 16 months ago, and that's where we're going to be today. I just have one more question for you, and I'd like to ask Dr. Levine um, something. Um, how many press conferences um, have there been up until this point? I had that, uh, I announced that yesterday, and it's, uh, I can't recall how many that was. I think this will be 146. Yeah, one, 146 is what I'm being told. And Dr. Levine, uh, one question for you. Um, would you recommend that vaccinated uh, individuals, if they feel sick, um, and it might be COVID, um, would you recommend them getting tested? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're still in a time where COVID is still in the environment, it's around us. Um, so if someone has anything on the symptom checklist for COVID, um, even if they're vaccinated, it would be a good idea to get a test. Uh, the likelihood in Vermont of them having a positive test is very low. You know, the number of cases that we've seen in vaccinated people, six in 10,000 
So it's a pretty, the odds are pretty much saying it's probably a common cold or something else of the sort. But at the same time, I think we're at a time period where uh, we all want to continue to protect one another. So getting a test is so easy. And uh, believe me, there are no lines for testing now. So uh, one can go, no matter what region of the state, to one of our testing centers and get tested. Thank you so much. Yeah, I believe we still have um, 16 or 17 fixed sites still available, yes. I believe. So it is easy uh, to accomplish, and it's free. So take advantage of that. A peace of mind, if nothing else. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Good morning. Sorry I was unable to overcome the technical and audio challenges of yesterday's press conference, and I missed the opportunity to congratulate you and your cabinet on hitting the 80% benchmark. I also want to acknowledge how responsive and helpful the staff of your cabinet members have been. Every piece of information that was promised has been delivered, whether it was from Secretary French's office, Secretary Smith's office, or Secretary Curley, who reached out herself via email several times. I thank you all for that, and thanks, too, to Jason and Rebecca for their yeoman's work wrangling reporters for these press conferences. And we have heard from readers that they're having issues finding appropriate summer programming for their children. Do you have a sense of whether the number of slots for kids is sufficient? And if not, how big is that gap? You know, I think it's, uh, it depends on the region. Um, obviously, we're trying to make sure there are enough slots available for any, uh, any uh, child or, or younger person who wants it, um, because we think it's that important. Um, but, uh, but I can get someone, I, I don't have that information here. Uh, but it certainly could have somebody contact you and uh, provide you with that information because I think it's, you know, it's more regionalized and, and there may be opportunities that uh, uh, that may not be apparent. So we'd be happy to to look into that for you. Great, thank you. That's it for me. Wilson Ring, the Associated Press. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. I have a couple of, I think they're quick questions. Um, Dr. Levine, you kind of mentioned this when you were speaking earlier, but do you think that uh, COVID is going forward, is going to become just an, an endemic background disease that's going to pop up pretty much forever? You probably don't want me to say yes, but I, I think you're correct that that's what the predictions are. Uh, but that would be far better than being an epidemic or a pandemic disease um, so um, I think when doctors see symptomatic patients with the appropriate symptoms, uh, there'll be times that they'll be doing a test that can look for several viruses at one time on the nasal swab, and one of those uh, will be COVID. So the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I guess this is for the governor and uh, Dr. Levine, both of you. Have either of you missed any of the, what was it, 146 of these news conferences? And now that the emergency is over, do you have any vacation plans? Either or all, all of you? Yeah, I, I believe that I missed at least one, I believe. And Dr. Levine might have missed one as well. So we're tied. <laughs> <laughs> but any travel plans? Um, I have no travel plans at this point in time. Dr. Levine? None in the immediate future. Okay. Okay, well, it seems like uh, I don't want to delay or uh, betray my journalistic objectivity, but I think you might be due, or at least <laughs> entitled. Anyway, thank you. Those are my questions. Well, thank you. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Governor, <clears throat> I'd like to echo what Lisa Loomis said about your leadership and your team over these past 15 months. Uh, we've heard from readers who asked us to share their ongoing thanks to you and, uh, and the fact that you're still standing after 146 grillings, uh, <laughs> says it all, I guess. So, <clears throat> and uh, you are welcome to ride your bike up to the Champlain Islands anytime you want. Well, I might yeah. want to do that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just following up on yesterday's question about the U.S.-Canadian border and certainly Commissioner Pichek's numbers from Canada and Quebec are very encouraging. And as I mentioned, there are 15 international crossing points 
uh, in the four northern counties. What can you do, and maybe the other 12 governors in states that chair the Canadian border, to, to pressure President Biden, Prime Minister Trudeau, to speed up the opening of the border? I mean, have the 13 governors caucused at all uh, on a reopening plan and, and maybe trying to share more vaccines with Canada? I know we talked yesterday about the fact that the U.S. is going to share vaccines, but obviously... It would have a huge economic impact if the Canadian border was open. That 90 miles is critical for a lot of businesses that depend on summer and fall tourism and, and everything. Yeah, I don't have any of the details, but I did hear some news this morning. It appears um, that there is going to be a meeting uh, fairly soon uh, with the uh, Canadian officials and uh, U.S. officials to talk about the border reopening. So I'm I'm really hopeful uh, that this will happen sometime in maybe July from my standpoint. And again, I don't, I, I'm just speculating uh, on what could happen because this really is up to uh, Canadian officials and U.S. officials. But we keep the pressure up. Um, we, um, we know it's important to us, especially for the northern part of the state. Uh, but uh, but it's, uh, it's something we talk about with them quite often. And I believe that it's more on the other side. You know, it's the Canadian side that uh, they may have been more apprehensive. But as I said yesterday, they have, they have made uh, significant ground in terms of first doses uh, for Canadians uh, up in the 60% range, uh, which is uh, remarkable from where they were. And uh, the second doses, I think they're in the maybe the 9% range, something like that, but it's it's picking up. And so it doesn't appear that it's a problem with supply at, at this point. It may be uh, at this point uh, just getting the shots in arms. So we'll continue. Um, if, uh, if any um, Canadians come across the border for work-related issues, uh, we believe we can vaccinate them. So we'll continue to do our part in our small way. But is there any thought of caucusing with the other uh, 12 governors uh, to, to really develop a, a plan that the President Biden could use? Yeah, I, I don't know. Even one day. Yeah, we haven't we haven't spoken. Or hosting, you yourself hosting them. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done that. Um, but uh, we did have a uh, New England governors. Uh, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Um, New England governors and uh, and. Uh, Eastern Premier's meeting, and we talked about this issue and and tried to advocate. But but again, I believe it's not the pressure on the on the U.S. side. Uh, I think we need the pressure on the other side, uh, on the uh, Canadian side. And they, you know, the, some of their um, some premiers are, are just reading their own constituents are saying uh, that they're a bit apprehensive uh, about opening up the border. So I'm not, I'm not sure that they're as excited about this as we are at this point. Uh, but this was a couple weeks ago, and again, they've made significant gains in the number of vaccinations over the last even two weeks. So I, uh, I think this meeting will, will bear some fruit, and, uh, and I believe that we'll, we'll have some some word fairly soon on uh, on when the border will be reopened. Okay, very good. Thank you very much as always. Appreciate it. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I have a question about broadband, but just to follow up on Willie's question, um, I was wondering, it occurs to me, will the um, COVID vaccine be car become part of the regular flu uh, vaccine mix like H1N1 has become? I was just trying to determine who Willie is, but I guess it's Wilson Ring, correct? Wilson I, Ring, yeah. Will, yeah, yeah. I didn't know he had a <laughs> nickname, but... <laughs> um, Dr. Levine. <clears throat> it's, one of the it's one of the questions that will be answered with some of the research that's been going on for a couple months and will continue to go on this year. Um, keep in mind the original people in the clinical trials for the vaccine were uh, a summer ago. 
So there's about a year's worth now of uh, information available from them on antibody levels and how well they're maintaining those levels. And that's going to determine the uh, need for or frequency at which we need to have booster doses. So no one is committing to a one-year booster yet, um, but it's been foreshadowed for a long time. But it could go longer than a year if people's um, immune response is really robust. So uh, I can't really answer your question until that research has been completed, and it's really in progress now. Um, because that would also then raise the issue, if it's one year, well then you might think probably you'd get a yearly shot, like the flu shot. But if it's not one year, uh, it may be something different, um, like other vaccines we have, where you may get two or three doses in a lifetime. So it's very hard to uh, give you a complete answer yet. Okay, very right, great, thank you. The, the governor wants to add something. Okay. I, I failed to mention uh, on the call with the White House this morning, Dr. Walensky did mention that there's a meeting scheduled for Friday to talk about boosters uh, and, uh, and second doses and so forth. And yearly. There's no vote that will be taken, but it will determine, I guess, w what is needed to determine that, whether how much more research and, and what areas they're going to concentrate on. So there is going to be a meeting on Friday. That's it, ACIP. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. As, as far as the broadband is concerned, Governor, you know, there's a, a ton of money out there, $150 million plus perhaps more coming. And people are wondering, well, when, when am I going to get my broadband and is it going to cost me, uh, you know, a car payment to, to get it? So there's those two concerns, when and how much. Yeah, well, I, uh, here's what I can tell you. Um, we want to expedite the process as quickly as, as we can. Um, the, the legislature did uh, put some uh, oversight in this. Uh, we have to uh, determine a, uh, an executive director for a board, uh, broadband board. So some of it's out of our hands, the administration's hands at this point. So there's a few steps we have to take uh, in the meantime, but we're, uh, we'll do, do all we can uh, to get this, uh, get this fiber on the poles and, and in the ground and everything we can do to, to get uh, uh, Vermonters the broadband that's needed. Uh, as far as the costs, again, uh, we, uh, we are in hopes that we're able to, we have this funding for the infrastructure to put, put that into place. Uh, so. Uh, that won't be uh, utilized as a, as a reason to to uh, charge more uh, because uh, because this funding will be be utilized for the for the infrastructure. Uh, the uh, CUDs uh, will have uh, a role to play in this as well, and uh, so they're almost a, a nonprofit in some respects. So uh, that should be advantageous in some regions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Ann Wallace-Allen, seven days. Hi. Um, I have a question about the expiration of the eviction moratorium next month. I'm wondering how the state is preparing for um, what's going to happen when presumably uh, at least some people are going to have to leave their rentals. I'm just wondering if you know how many people this might involve or what the timeline might be. I know there's going to be a backlog in the courts, but... Um, at some point, it does sound like there's going to be some movement there, and it doesn't really sound like there is any sort of housing set up for people who find themselves out of their homes. Yeah, um, I think Commissioner Hanford might be on and might be able to answer some of those questions. Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, so the eviction moratorium, it's, it's 30 days, um, so July 15th. You know, I don't think this is a surprise. This has been in, in the works for, for months, um, and rent was never forgiven uh, during that period. So many Vermonters have prepared for paying that back rent. There's over $375 million in federal aid to help with rental assistance, um, 
And we have community partners, more than 20 across the state, helping people access this assistance, language translation, landlord tenant mediation, technology assistance, you know, and funding has been provided to groups like Vermont Legal Aid to provide eviction prevention services. So, you know, we feel we have the resources in place to help folks. A lot of the um, requirements that are slowing this down are, are federal, and we really can't, um, you know, waive those. Folks need to submit the necessary paperwork, prove that they're eligible. Um, you know, I, I think that we will have the time to, to solve most of these problems. And it's important to know that the eviction process is a lengthy one. It takes time and that it can be halted at any point um, by paying your back rent if the eviction is for non-payment of rent. So it's important that we go back to you know due process and these cases get heard and, and we, we restore that uh, for both landlords and tenants' benefit. So, do you have any idea how many cases this affects or how many households this might affect? You know, I don't have exact numbers. You know, there has been um, a significant drop in the number of eviction filings during this period. I know that for certain. Um, you know, their folks were still able to file evictions, but they weren't processed. Uh, in a normal year, it's about 600. Uh, I have not received um, update from the court on how much, how many evictions are in process right now. I don't believe it is a tsunami coming. I think that folks have been preparing for this and that there's ample assistance to help people pay their back rent and utilities and even going forward for more than a year, um, more than 375 million in aid to help people pay their rent. So um, I think that's a lot of help for folks. It's a little bit of an unusual situation now because I have heard from more than one person who is being evicted because their landlord is selling the house and they're doing that because house prices are so extraordinarily high right now. So for those who can't gain access to the money to help them pay their back rent and stay where they are, they're going to have to leave. And right now it's hard for them to find another place. Does the state have anything other than rental assistance in place to help them? Well, you know, you're bringing up, uh, you know, our, our housing situation. And as uh, the governor mentioned, you know, we had an historic um, amount of funding provided to build more housing, more than $130 million to directly uh, support the building of more affordable housing. And, you know, this funding can be matched with the rental assistance to help people exit homelessness, uh, as Secretary Smith mentioned. And it's, it's an ongoing effort. You know, we need to build more housing also middle-income homeownership units and you know and there's more work to do in this area but everyone's working collaboratively and, and building units as fast as possible right but that's not i mean that money is obviously not going to turn into housing within the next few months yeah and don't forget you know two or three years ago when we had a um, historic amount which we thought was historic at that point 37 million dollar housing bond and then it leveraged another 65 million of, of private assets for $100 million worth of housing, which was historic at that point. Um, that's still being completed right now. I mean, that's uh, we're seeing the tail end of that. So it's not as though we haven't been building any housing. It's just that we know, we've known for quite some time, we need more of it. Exactly, and I would just add that last winter, with the CRF money, we were able to build 500 units of housing in, in six to eight months. So some of these projects can happen fast. We have more work to do in this area. We need to have a more efficient permitting and regulations to allow the housing to be built quicker in the areas we want. Um, you know, all, all I can say is folks are doing everything they can to try to bring more units online, and, and we need to continue to work together to, uh, to help um, you know, build more housing. We also, Anne, as you might recall, during the legislative session, uh, sought to, to uh, expedite some permitting uh, in some areas, particularly in communities and downtowns, and uh, we weren't successful in, in completing that, but we, we are going to uh, continue to monitor that, and if that's a, a bottleneck, then we will we'll again ask the legislature to help us out.
All right, we'll move to Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Greg Lamoureux. Okay, we'll can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Hey, thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. I uh, just want to reiterate what a few other reporters have said, and, and thank you and your staff for the, uh, the leadership uh, through this pandemic. Um, it, it, I do also, at the same time, want to circle back around to a question that I asked a, a handful of months ago. Um, and at the time, you, you basically kind of said, you know, we're, we're still right in the thick of it, haven't gotten to, to think of that, about it much. Um, hindsight being 2020, uh, what would you have done different um, if, if you could go back 15, 16, maybe even 24 months and prepare and, and respond to this pandemic? Well, it's easy, you know, um, playing Monday morning quarterback in some respects. Um, it, it depends on whether you're talking, you know, on the federal level or the state level. Um, I think we did the best we could under the circumstances and uh, with the cards that we were dealt. Um, but there were a number of, of issues that we as a country, we as the world, weren't prepared for. Um, so that, um, that becomes problematic to, to go back and unwind that and determine what we should have, could have, would have, should have done uh, at that, that point. But, um, but there are going to be numerous. And I think I said on, on Monday or yesterday that, you know, in the future, uh, we are going to have to invest more in, uh, in, in science, I believe, in this, in this country and probably in the world uh, to to better prepare ourselves uh, for the future, uh, putting all of the PPE and so forth in place and making sure that we have um, manufacturing sites maybe within our control here in this country. Uh, I think we had to, we relied heavily, especially with PPE on other countries. And I wish we had had more manufacturing ability right here in the U.S. and that we could have controlled that more and protected ourselves better. I just remember, uh, you know, going to great lengths trying to find uh, PPE and uh, testing supplies and so forth. And we just weren't prepared as a country uh, or, again, as, as in a world population. So, so I think going back, that would be some of my, my thoughts. Dr. Levine, anything you'd want to add to that? <clears throat> I think not too much to add to those thoughts. Um, I think we learned perhaps as a state that it's not a good situation when you have to have 50 states competing with one another at a time of a crisis and even competing with premiers and prime ministers around the world as well. Um, that doesn't say so much about what we could do or not do better uh, because there were a lot of national issues at that time that we kind of were stuck with. Um, anytime you have 256 people who are no longer with us, you, you ask yourself those questions in the middle of the night all the time. Um, I wish I could say that you know some percentage of those were people we could have saved from the fate that ultimately uh, they succumbed to, but the reality was early on uh, the virus spread so quickly and we lost a number of people in some of our nursing homes and we forever regret that, but at the same time we tried our best. We implemented all kinds of restrictive visitation procedures, et cetera. Uh, so very challenging uh, questions, but I do think the issues of having PPE, having a stockpile of PPEs, having reliable PPE that uh, you know 
is actually what it is supposed to be, especially with regard to the uh, N95 and KN95 mask is really important. And then, um, you know, I think our state learned so much along the way about our need to stockpile that equipment to get whatever testing capability it could have and diversify that so we would not be dependent on one supply line. I'd say most of what we learned, we learned along the way, but we learned it early along the way, so we tried to implement things as quickly as possible that would prevent us from running short on one supply or another supply and uh, being stuck. So, you know, the ultimate answer to the question is uh, a country that has invested much more in public health and in emergency preparedness. And I don't mean emergency preparedness for blizzards, hurricanes, floods, um, because those are events that don't have this long of a tail end, so to speak, and an aftermath. Uh, they, they have an aftermath that can be very substantial from devastation, but um, the actual natural event comes and goes. Um, we need to make sure that we remember that viruses like this coronavirus um, are probably in our future and probably less than once in a century. So I think we need to always be cognizant of that. That's, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Uh, both a lot more extensive answers than I expected. Thank you. Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Thank you, Jason. Um, if I understood Secretary Smith uh, correctly, it sounds like about two-thirds of the people that are in motel housing right now and emergency vouchers will be able to stay beyond July 1. That still leaves 700 to 800 folks who are going to have to leave after June 30th. I'm wondering if each of those individuals will be getting a $2,500 check, um, and also what else uh, will be done to help uh, both folks who uh, maybe don't have a place to go um, and also the communities that uh, they're going to be camping in lots of instances. Um, I think I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Brown uh, to weigh in. He's been working with our community partners uh, for quite some time on this very issue, so he probably has all the information at his fingertips. Um, uh, thank you, Governor. Um, yes, uh, Sean Brown, Commissioner. Um, in terms of the number of households that will be ineligible, you, you are correct, Peter. Uh, there's a little over 720 households that will no longer be eligible. That, that's our estimate right now. Obviously, we will go through the eligibility process with those households to see if they do meet a category uh, moving forward. But uh, based on the information we have for those households right now, we believe it's about 720 households will not be eligible um, at the end of June. Um, each of those households will be eligible for the $2,500 payment um, if, if, um, as they transition out of the program. Um, and we are working very closely with our um, partner, housing partners across the state as they um, develop uh, transitional housing plans for each of these households in terms of um, what options might be available, whether um, it's moving into a permanent housing situation, returning to live with family or friends, if that's where they came from before the pandemic, um, as, as the state shut down last spring. Also, some of them might transition into another system of care, um, depending on their level of need. That could be um, um, a, a treatment facility or a community care home. Um, you know, we saw systems of care shut down across the state and, and individuals coming into the emergency housing program, and we want to reestablish folks into those places as well. Um, and, and for those who, who choose to um, want to camp, you know, we, they, we, there would be supports in place for those as well. Um, and so there's a wide variety of options available for, the, for those households that are not eligible. And our goal is to make sure that they all have a safe place to go and are working hard to, to, with the planning on the transition for those households now. Thank you, Commissioner. One more uh, quick question for you, Governor. You said that the executive order that you're signing, I believe today, will uh, enable Vermont to continue to avail itself of some of the federal funding streams established for emergencies. Can, do you know offhand exactly which revenue sources 
you're going to be able to continue to be able drawing down by signing this executive order? Jay, do you have the answer to that? Jay Johnson here. Hi, Peter. I believe it's federal. It's FEMA funding for the most part for emergency housing resources um, for feeding the same, and I believe that it's supplemental um, uh, SNAP assistance for um, that's coming from HHS from a different program. Thank you all, as always. Avery Powell, WCAX. Avery Powell. All right, we'll move to Aaron Patenko, VT Digger. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Go ahead, Avery. Governor, you've mentioned a lot about how we got to this 80% mark and doing the age band approach, but can you talk a little bit about why you think Vermonters went and got the vaccine and really stepped up before the July 4th deadline? You know, I don't, I don't have the complete answer, um, except that I, knowing Vermonters um, the way I think I do, uh, most wanted to do the right thing, wanted to do the right thing for their families and friends, and um, knew they had enough faith in uh, what Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, and others were, were saying uh, in, in terms of the, the safeness of the vaccine, uh, they were willing to do so. Uh, and, and again, it was uh, a joint effort on a number of different fronts, and, and finally bringing you know, in the beginning, when we had the vaccine, there was such a huge demand uh, that it was uh, outstripping the supply. Uh, towards the end, we had to change uh, our approach because, you know, the demand decreased, the supply increased, and so we had to find ways uh, to meet them where they are. And, and that's why we tried a number of different ways. And we, there isn't any one way that worked better than others. Uh, I think uh, just the combined effort uh, and, and highlighting the fact that they were, there was vaccine available and, and with the help of the media, I think it all worked together uh, to bring people to the point we are today. So I, I don't know if there's one single answer. It was just a joint effort on everyone's part uh, across Vermont, uh, across different sectors. Uh, and that doesn't, it's not just from the government standpoint because it took, uh, it took the whole village to get together uh, to bring us to this point. And the second question, is the expiration of the state of emergency going to have an impact on DMV operations? Um, I don't, not significantly. Um, what we found with DMV, for instance, uh, there are a number of people that are using online services more, uh, doing it by mail, um, and I expect that will continue. Obviously, we'll be reopening uh, the, some of the facilities as well, and uh, and I think there'll be more in person. So I don't know if there's going to be a significant change, but, um, but hopefully it will all be for the better. Whatever the change is, it will all be for the better. Thank you. Aaron Patenko, VT Digger. Hi. Measures in your executive order are uh, expected to last, um, particularly the continued federal assistance um, for food and housing. I think I got part of that, Aaron. Um, so the executive order will lapse tonight. The the or the emergency order, the executive order that we'll put into place will fill the gap. Uh, for some of the funding for the homeless program and feeding and so forth. So we don't expect that there will be any lapse in between. This will just uh, continue as we know it today from a funding standpoint. So the funding continues indefinitely into the future? Oh, I think there's, a, there's an end date uh, there uh, as well. I mean, that'll be uh, determined federally. Uh, so there's an end date. I just don't, I'm not quite sure when that is, but some of the dates I've heard, of course, um, like the 
uh, $300 supplemental on the UI ends in September. And uh, so I'm sure that there will be others that other programs that will be ending as well. I just don't, I don't have the answer, but we can get it for you. Okay, so there's there's no particular end to the, the funding on the executive orders part, like you don't specify that the executive order will continue for another month? No. Okay, yeah. Um, and and uh, the National Guard is also activated indefinitely? Yes, until we determine when we don't need that uh, that resource anymore. We don't want that to be indefinite, but you know, we'll continue to utilize them as much as we need to. Mm -hmm. They've been a great partner. Yes, okay. Um, my other question is, um, you know, as the state reopens, a lot of counties are at or near that 80% benchmark, but Essex County is still only about 56% vaccinated. Um, does that concern you, um, you know, as a potential place where community transmission could happen because the vaccination rate is lower than the rest of the state? Yeah. I mean, it, it concerns me. I would like to see the number increase, obviously. Um, but uh, again, we'll try and we're not going to give up on them. We'll provide uh, for opportunities for them to get vaccinated and try to um, uh, meet them where they are in terms of giving them the information. Maybe as time goes on, they'll see that others uh, have uh, have experienced, uh, you know, a, a more healthy uh, life and uh, without uh, fear of, of the virus or any of the variants. And that may help them come around to the fact that they should get vaccinated. But um, we're not going to give up. Um, but. But again, it's it's rural, uh, in obviously in that uh, that area, fewer people. It wouldn't take too many to get up to that 80% in that region, and uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, we'll continue our efforts. Thank you. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. I, uh, I do have one question, which is uh, kind of related to the last one. Uh, I was talking to an administrator at North Country Hospital yesterday, and he said that the hospital's not been receiving the um, Pfizer vaccines to be able to use on the uh, 12 to 15 year old age group. I was wondering uh, why they're not getting the vaccine in, and um, is there a supply chain issue with that? That and would that would yeah. in Orleans County or Essex County. That would surprise me, Ed. Um, but uh, but have that administrator give us a call um, because we can rectify that pretty quick. I'm pretty sure. Okay, he was pretty clear that he didn't receive any. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to be equally equally clear. I I believe we can fix that if uh, if there's a problem. So. Give us a call. Should, Give us a second. Should I have him call your, I have him call your office you can, or, or Dr. Levine? I, Secretary Smith would be most appropriate. What's your cell number? <laughs> five, five, five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will, uh, I'll have him make contact to uh, Secretary Smith. I, Great. I will reach out. Uh, yeah, and uh, Secretary Smith yeah. said he will reach out uh, to North Country Hospital as well. Okay, oh, wait. very good. Thank but you. Doc That's all I have for a question. Yeah, Dr. Levine might have a comment on this. Oh, okay, sure. The, the, the only thing I wanted to comment on is um, obviously the Essex County number does seem low, and it's lower than other, other counties. We're trying to dig into a little more to see if it's really as low as the number 56%. or could be a little higher. You may recall the state of New Hampshire just developed a registry of its own, which is newly launched. Uh, there may be some data for Vermonters who have gone to pharmacies in New Hampshire uh, or other sites in New Hampshire and gotten their vaccine. So the number could be higher, but I can't tell you that for sure now. Uh, but we have a team working on trying to figure out if there's more data to reconcile, um, which would help not only help the number in that county look Good, but it would also obviously be very useful to know that the county is actually at a higher vaccination rate than we had thought. So more to come, but I can't tell you exactly when. 
Okay, well, up, up in the northern part especially, a lot of the medical services are in New Hampshire and Colebrook. So that would make sense. Okay, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, one question I had was, uh, Secretary Smith, when you were going through the list of obviously the pharmacies, but also where uh, vaccination clinics and opportunities will be held, are any of them uh, providing the option of the Johnson & Johnson vaccination, or is it all either Pfizer or Moderna? Tom, I believe it's a mix, but I'm uh, it, uh, in terms of what uh, who is doing what with Johnson and Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer? But I will, I will double check on that. They get their on through the federal pharmacy program. They get their uh, distribution separately than ours. So I don't remember off the top of my head how much Johnson and Johnson is coming to them. But in the past, it's been a mix of Johnson and Johnson, Moderna, and uh, Pfizer. But I'll get back to you, Tom, on it. So Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, one other question. With the announcement yesterday from the state police that uh, they're going back to more normalized operations uh, with your proclamation, Governor, uh, one thing that seems to everyone wants to know is will we see more state police vehicles on the roads in Vermont? I, I believe you will. And so I would advocate uh, and advise people to slow down. Um, you're going to see more activity out on the on the highways in terms of the Vermont State Police. Very good. Thank you all. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Well, Governor, you've been asked about offering interstate assistance um, on another interstate crisis. Governor Abbott of Texas and Governor Ducey of Arizona on June 10th sent a letter to, I believe, all of their fellow governors invoking the Interstate Emergency Management Assistance Compact seeking to help to stop the inflow of illegal immigrants. The, in 1999, the Vermont legislature joined this compact, which promises help for, quote, any disaster or emergency declared by the governor of the affected party state. So will Vermont be sending help as requested by Governor Abbott and Governor Ducey, and if so, what kind? And if not, why not? Um, I haven't received any calls from either Governor Ducey or Governor Abbott, and uh, they have my number. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not aware uh, that they need our help, but, um, but obviously we'll do whatever we can to assist them. Thank you. Um, Governor, also, is it permissible uh, now for an employer to terminate an employee who refuses vaccination? Uh, and if so, is a negative antibody test acceptable um, as an alternative? Yeah, that's a legal question I don't have the answer to. Um, be happy to research that, though. I just, I, don't, I just don't know, Guy. It hasn't come up um, when employers are, are, are talking about, well, can we, can we fire someone or get rid of someone who's not vaccinated? That I no one's brought that up? Yeah, I haven't heard that question as of yet, but... I'm, okay. I would imagine it will. Great. Well, Maybe, I look forward to um, I'm, gonna, on, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to let Jay Johnson uh, add a little bit of color to this. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Um, hi, Guy. I um, We've researched this a little bit um, in terms of whether an employer can fire someone um, for not being vaccinated. The problem with the vaccinations, I think, is everyone recognizes it's an emergency use authorization at this point. And I think that the law just isn't clear. The EEOC has provided certain guidance and um, there's a different law under which the um, emergency authorization is issued. Uh, so it's really not that clear. And I don't know of any litigation that has tested it yet. So I think like the governor said, we probably will see some litigation arising out of it and then we'll, um, but I think really, as Dr. Levine has said in the past, what we're hoping for is the commercial use authorization um, and then employers can make that decision. So once, once it's authorized, uh, then they will be able to terminate. 
I, well, that would be the That's theory. The theory. Yes, I mean, I would say unless something changes in law, I think that would be the theory. Okay, well, what about uh, if someone says, hey, I've got a negative antibody test. Antibodies show I don't, I don't have it. Uh, is, is that... Uh, is that an acceptable alternative? I think that's going to be another one of those test, real life test cases. Right. I, I, you okay. know, a legal, well, a legal I'm, test, I would say. And finally, I just want to say that uh, uh, Jason, your press secretary, has been the most responsive, helpful press contact of any governor I've got help from in the last 20 years. And he's, he's done good work, and so have all the rest of you as well. Well, well, thank you. I haven't heard anyone compliment him uh, to that degree. <laughs> That's it. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again next week.